We are living in the greatest period in human history. A period of massive technological and economic advancement. Never in our history have we been so close to a world where we can live truly free and independent lives. But here's the thing. There are those with money, power, and influence who would rather see you dependent on them and the system they created. A system designed to keep you comfortable, apathetic, and distracted. We believe the road to true independence doesn't come through political elections or senseless regulation, but rather in maximizing the empowerment of the individual. If you feel the same way, then get ready. My name's Jason Stapleton. Welcome to Wealth, Power, and Influence. Well, welcome back, everybody, to this thing we call Monday. I'm very happy that you're here. I will tell you, told the guys in the uh, pre-show about this. If you guys want to be part of the pre-show, it's jasonstapleton.com forward slash members. It's just five bucks. It's a way that you kind of give back, get a chance to chat with all the other people who are interested in the same stuff that we talk about on this show every day. And uh, we do a little pre-show post-show for you. And if you uh, are following us on the Twitters or the Periscope or YouTube or uh, where else, Facebook, wherever we're streaming live, we appreciate you too. Thanks for being here. Thanks for investing in us. We're just watching our we're watching our video views skyrocket here over the last couple of mo- over the last month or so, and we are very very excited about that. I am feeling. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm feeling under the weather today. I scratched my, uh, this is going to sound so weird, but I scratched my eye on Friday afternoon, Friday night or something, and I woke up on Saturday with the worst headache that I've ever, I can ever remember having. It was blinding. I don't know what was wrong with me, but I felt like my head was going to explode, like it was being sawed in half by the pain. And my eye hurt, and it was like watering and runny. And I thought, man, did I forget to take my contact out last night? Is it jammed up in there somewhere? It felt like there was something in my eye. And I started doing I, – I literally slept from uh, – that. went to bed that night at normal time. And then I woke up at my normal time around 8 o'clock and, and, uh, on a Saturday. And I was in so much pain that I literally went back to sleep until 6 p.m. And then I got up. And I was at least able to function. I stayed up for a few hours. And then by 9 o'clock that night, I went back to sleep and I slept the whole rest of the night. My eye, I'm wearing glasses today. My eye is still bothering me. Um, and I have I've had a terrible time sleeping last night. And so I, I apologize to you if, uh, if you get the sense that I'm a little more down today than I normally would. But, man, I am here to power through and to bring you guys uh, bring you guys some really fantastic content. So I appreciate you guys being here, and I'm going to give you 100% of what I got today so that uh, you guys can can get some real value out of out of what we're going to talk about. Now, what are you looking at? I just realized the clock says 11.35, and I yeah. panicked for a second, but it's yeah, not 11.35. That's not true, yeah. Somehow they changed yeah, the clock on they, us. Yeah. Well, we're getting ready to spring forward, which is, Ooh, yeah. I don't know why, now we lose another hour of sleep. Like it's not like I need it. I'm gonna be up anyway. But I'm uh, be up at three a.m. That's right. <laughs> Mayor Pete is out of the race. I gotta tell you guys, I am. Uh, I'm a little surprised at this because he he definitely could have gone farther. It's interesting because it looks. Matt and I were talking about it this morning. It would appear as though someone went to a few of these guys and said, "Look, time for you to bow out. You're not gonna get the nomination." And we need to consolidate all of our ammunition around defeating Bernie Sanders and making sure that he doesn't sweep the delegates going into uh, going into the convention. And so they've left Warren in because Warren is a direct competitor to Bernie Sanders. Uh, Buttigieg is out. Uh, Saw uh, is it Stayer? Stayer is out. Yeah, whatever it is. Bloomberg is going to stay in, but I don't think the establishment wants Bloomberg because Bloomberg is 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 going to be as uncontrollable as Trump is, and nobody is going to want to cede power to him in the uh, at, at the in the at the Democratic um, operational level. And so, based on that, who do they got? Well, they either got to back Elizabeth Warren or they got to back Biden. And it looks like they're going to try and back. I'm shocked that they're going to do this. Uh, frankly, it, it, this is the stupidest move. You, you think that these people are intelligent. They're really not. They're not that sharp. They don't know. And this is true for Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians. The, the, 
those in the halls of power at these institutions are not nearly as sharp as you think they are. And so if, the, if, if it's true and they've decided to try and back Biden in the hopes of splitting the vote, uh, then what you're going to see is more and more of these folks are going to start dropping out and we're essentially going to have a three-person race. Well, we'll have four because Bloomberg will be in it as well. But you're going to have a Warren. Warren will eventually have to fall out too. But then a Biden, a Sanders, and uh, and a and a Bloomberg. Do we have any idea how Bloomberg is poll? How did Bloomberg do in South Carolina? I don't think he's really interested in trying to win any states. I think all he, if you if you are here in California, every commercial has two Bloomberg ads running on it. Like that dude is spending a, like a hundred million dollars a day or a week or something on advertising because he's everywhere all the time. But I'm just curious as to how he finished up in these. Uh, he wasn't even a, he wasn't even option. wasn't even option. on the ballot. Yeah. Okay, so I don't know what his big plan is, but it's got to be to be the content the the potential option going into uh, going into the convention. But if if the Democratic establishment don't want him again i don't know what his plan is maybe it's to run as a third party That's maybe, what I think. maybe his ultimate goal is to run third party and pull votes away from sanders or from biden in the hopes of leaving trump in a position of power because better him than one of those other numbskulls what check this out so of the presumptive it's going to be down to four guys basically bernie bloomberg biden and trump of the four of them trump who is currently the oldest president ever. I mean, for, for context, Trump is like the same age as Bill Clinton. So Clinton was president 25 years ago, and Trump is the same age as him. Trump's the oldest president ever, and he's the youngest of those four. Biden is 77, and Bloomberg and Bernie are both 78. Well, Trump's 73. Wow. These, they're a bunch of old white dudes running for president. I just, it's, yeah, it is what it is. You know, it takes time to amass that kind of power and that amount of control. You got to be in your 70s, 60s, or 70s before you can run for president. Uh, I don't know. I, what I want to talk about today is something, you know, in stark contrast to this discussion that they're having about politics right now or about coronavirus, because I, I think it doesn't really matter who gets elected. See, we're facing some some pretty significant changes in our economy over the next couple of decades, and I'm in the process of writing a white paper. Every once in a while, I'll write one of these. Over the last decade or so, I've written, actually less than that, the last eight years or so, I've written two. I wrote one called The Babylon Report, and I wrote another one called The Coming Divide. The first one was about the cause of the economic collapse in 2008 and 9, and I wrote that because so many people misunderstood at the time what had really happened, and I wanted people to understand that this was not a result uh, of a, a, a banking greed, although that was certainly part of it, but more because the government had removed any risk from them pursuing that greed, and uh it was a series of uh, it was a series of events that had happened long before. It goes all the way back, to really, to the Clinton administration. That only, it has nothing to do with Republican or Democrat either. It's just that's when it kind of started. That was when the outlawing of redlining of districts happened. And so, I wanted to talk a little bit about that and share what really happened in hopes of educating people on what was to come. And the second one I wrote was called The Coming Divide, which was written after Obamacare was passed. And I wanted people to understand what was really in the bill and what it meant if everything got passed. And we were very lucky because a lot of what I, what I talked about in there didn't come to fruition, mainly because some of the most damaging aspects of Obamacare never came to fruition. Uh, you know, the, the taxing of businesses and such that they kept delaying and delaying never really happened. And so you didn't see the worst effects of Obamacare. But you are still seeing many of the things that I talked about in that paper. Well, the one I'm writing now is called Evolution and How to Prosper in the Greatest Economic Shift in Human History. And that is a very bold claim, but I hope that over the course of the next hour, I can explain to you how true that claim is. 
by taking you back to very early on, actually right after the, just before, right after the Revolutionary War, and help you guys understand what we're facing just in terms of the change that's about to happen in our economy. And it's really hard to believe that in the next 20 years, you're going to have about 40 million jobs that are 40 million people who are who have to completely change industries because their jobs no longer exist. I mean, that's about a third of our workforce. It's it, it, it's it's very, very difficult for people to wrap their head around that, like not just, oh, their 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 jobs are going to go down or they're not going to be paid as much or they're going to be obsolete like their job literally won't exist anymore. And everything that they've spent the last 20 years, 30 years doing is going to evaporate and be gone. And the question is, what are they going to do? And the bulk of people are not going to heed this warning. They're not going to pay attention to it. They're not going to see it until it's too late. And then they're going to be scrambling. And they're going to be saying things like, oh, we never could have seen this happen. How could we have known? And, oh, this is, the, this is, a, this is, a, this is a problem that uh, exists because some corporation is greedy and oh, it's getting rid of our jobs. When, in fact, it's just a natural evolution that happens in every economy over periods of time. And I want to talk about the last, really, five of those that occurred just in American history. Okay, so we're talking about just the last less than 300 years, the number of changes that have occurred and what that meant to our economy. So let's start out with 18, I'm sorry, 1784, and this is really the first major transition. So prior to this, prior to 1880, we really had a largely agrarian society. Yes, you had blacksmiths and you had other support, you, but you really had people who were working in the Industrial Revolution hadn't happened yet. And really, people worked on farms. They were agrarian. And then all of the support mechanisms, the people who built plows, the people who were uh, metallurgy, the people who ground and made bread, the people who sewed on spinning looms and things like that, they all were in support of what was largely an agrarian society. And in 1784, we had something, we had the railroads and steam engines come about. This is where you saw um, the Commodore and uh, Vanderbilt, who made his fortune around this time, first in the steam engine business. So Vanderbilt started, his, started making his money by running a steam engine up and down, a steamship up and down the, uh, the canals there around New York City really interesting story about him and about capitalism in general. See, capitalism still very, very new at this time, and no one really understood. It was kind of like the Wild West of capitalism. And people talk about this, especially in libertarian societies, as though it was some sort of really great thing. But it came with a great deal of, of, uh, of violence and, and a great deal of underhanded activity. And Vanderbilt was a big part of this. If you read his, autobi- his biography, you learn a great deal about the type of capitalism that was enacted back then. And for anybody who thinks that, oh, government wasn't part of capitalism back then and government was free of, the, of capitalist influence, all you have to do is go read Vanderbilt's biography to find out that wasn't true. That there was a great deal of government interference and backhanded deals and payoffs that happened in order to ensure that Vanderbilt was able to run his operation. In fact, many years later, when Vanderbilt uh, steam engines were running, he ended up getting a mail contract to run mail uh, through the through the Indies. I can't remember where it was, uh, but and he was given that contract because of his political connections. But very early on. The advent of the steam power and railroads started to revolutionize our economy in ways that we'd never seen before. Now, how did this affect us? Well, think about how difficult it was to move goods and, and, and move people from one point to another prior to steam engines and prior to railroads. Think about the work that would have been required to lay all of the railroad track, to build the steam engines, to, to then uh, transport and move the goods and services. There was a whole new industry of jobs that began to emerge because of this. Now, these just happened to be very low-skill, uh, cheap worker jobs that were done largely by immigrants. 
This was when you started to see the first influx of immigrant labor coming into the United States. Chinese labor, um, Irish labor coming in and being put to work. Many of them didn't speak English and many of them had no skills other than a strong back and a good work ethic. And they had a dream and a passion of being able to move their families to America because there was at least some opportunity there. Opportunity that didn't exist anywhere else. Sometimes a standard work day, in those, ta- in, in those days, standard work day was 12 to 14 hours a day and you worked six days a week. To give you an idea of how good we have it today, that was where they were back then. And they did it because there were no other choices. Remember, it was laying track from east to west or working in the fields starving to death in their home countries. These were the opportunities that were available at that time. But you saw a shift in the economy that happened where people started to be able to come here and do work other than work on a farm. They began to work for companies, railroad companies, steamship companies. You had guys, like I said, Vanderbilt, who first in the steamship business, taking people up and down the, uh, up and down the passageways, the waterways around New York, and then later in the, uh, in, in the railroad business, much later in his life, by the way, into the railroad business. This was, what, this was the new industry that evolved. It allowed us to move goods and services quickly across hundreds of miles relative to what we used to be able to do. And it allowed a whole new group of people who were living in abject poverty to raise themselves up and not necessarily to come out of poverty, but to give their children an opportunity that they would never have. An opportunity to read and write, to go to school, opportunity to potentially get a better job and work as a a better job at the factory than they had. See, there wasn't much of a chance for them for their kids to get out of the factory or to get out of the mill or wherever it was they were working, but they had an opportunity to learn to read and write, to improve their own education. And that was something that a great deal of the immigrants coming to America couldn't do. They had never learned how to do it. So this all started in about uh, 1784. And about 100 years later, in around 1870, so that's transition one, We move from primarily an agrarian society into the next phase, which is, for lack of a better term, uh, agrarian plus. And I actually have some numbers here somewhere. I may have to dig them up and give them to you later. I know know the rough numbers here. Let me just see if I can dig them up for you because it was, uh, it's, it's pretty powerful. As we move into 1870, we're now looking at mass production the assembly line starts to take hold in America. We see electrical power uh, and uh, and we see these new technologies increasing the workday for a lot of people, increasing the productive power, moving people. We begin begin to see people in around 1870 start to move off of the farms and into the factories in a way that we had as, as the start of the industrial revolution really begins to take hold. And this is the very beginning. And keep in mind, it took us from from 1780 to around 1870, about 100 years, to make that first transition. Rail lines to be built, new technology to come about, electric lines start to be laid. You now have cables where you can send, uh, send messages across the United States. These things didn't exist before. And you see an increase in productivity and new jobs are being created. And now people are moving off of the farms into the factories. And the factories are producing goods at a record pace. And the cost of those goods are falling. And people now can show up and you're starting to get into regular working hour days. And they're moving into shifts on assembly lines. Again, still very repetitive work, right? You guys remember the early Model T's that they had? And... uh, and uh, when Henry Ford, this was, Henry Ford was a little bit later. When did Henry Ford start Ford Motor Company? When did he start the assembly line? While I'm looking this up uh, and grabbing these other docks. I, don't, I can't believe I didn't pull this earlier, but I'll get it here in just a second because I want you guys to know just exactly where we were. 
Ford and Malcolmson was reincorporated as the Ford Motor Company on June 16, 1903, with 28,000 capital. Yeah. So by the time we put the, it was 1903, roughly, by the time that we put the first, uh, you know, the, the first real assembly line started going and, and we were able to mass manufacture the first automobile. But assembly lines were beginning to take effect. And over the next 30 or 40 years, we see that turn into shift work the industrial revolution that we understand it as today. Now, I'll give you an example here. In 1850, the percentage of Americans working in agriculture, 65%. Six out of 10 people in America worked on a farm in, 18, in 1850. By 19, by, let's go to 19, let's go to 1980, okay? By 1980, Three percent worked on farms. If we just go a hundred years from 1850 to 1950, we go from 64 percent to 11 percent. Basically, from one in from six in ten to one in ten. So you see the transition that happens between 1870, 1850, 1870 to around 1950 is that virtually everybody begins to transition off of the farm and into the factories, into the, into the workforce, the, the modern-day workforce that we understand today. Now, again, these were large factories producing goods, using machines, but with human labor. And it was incredible the amount of economic expansion and productivity that happened during this time. We also had at the end of uh, the 1950s or 1940s into the 1950s, we had World War II, where the bulk of the industrialized world had all of their industrial capacity wiped out. See, after carpet bombing cities for a few years and destroying the whole of Europe, America was really the only country left with any productive capacity. And so after everybody had moved off the farms and they'd come back from war and now they're looking for jobs, guess what is readily available to them? Jobs, because why? We have an entire world that needs to be rebuilt. And the only country that can produce anything in large quantities is the United States. This, in conjunction with a lot of other things that happened about that time, led to a great expansion in U.S. wealth and allowed for the greatest generation in American history, the generation we call the greatest generation, to achieve what was then referred to as the American dream, which was what? Get up, have a little house, couple of kids and a dog, go off and work at the factory, come home, have enough to feed your family, and then retire with a pension at the end of 50 or 60 years and die a couple of years later. This was the American dream in the 1950s. Then the 1969 hits, and we get automated production. And the advent, the very beginning of the computer revolution. Now again, we wouldn't see the computer revolution really take hold until the advent of the desktop computer, which would happen later in the the end of the 70s and 80s. But let me take you back and talk about the timeline compression that's happening here. So the first phase from 1780 to 1880, about a hundred year period to go from the first major economic shift to the second. Then from 1870 to 1970, roughly about another hundred year period, we see massive expansions and we see an entire shift to our economy. Over the first hundred year period, not a lot changed. All we got was just a lot of immigrant labor who now had the chance to do something other than starve, trying to produce food on their own. Okay? In the second phase from 1870 to 1970, we see the bulk of mankind. Now, these are all people who were working for themselves. Keep in mind, 1850, six out of every ten people in America worked on a farm. They worked for themselves. Going from Six in ten to one in ten. Only 10% of people now work on a farm, which means the bulk of them are working in factories, working in companies for somebody else. They're reliant now for the first time in their lives on somebody else for a living. But the beautiful thing about it is 
the Industrial Revolution gave them the opportunity to have more than they ever could have had if they'd have stayed on the farm. More wealth, more opportunity, a chance to advance, a chance to have the quote-unquote American dream. Then 19... 19- 69 hits, 1970 hits, and we start to see the technological revolution take over. And from about 1960 to 1980, we have automation that begins to take over. We see computers begin to do processing where we used to have individuals with slide rules and now we have calculators. See, it's the little technology pieces that start to take over, that increase productivity, that help to change people's lives. And then in the 19s, late 70s, early 80s, mid 80s into the 90s, the desktop computer begins to take over. And all of a sudden, automation and computer processing power now has a huge change to our entire lives and workforces. Now, keep in mind, 100 years for the first change, not much difference. 100 years for the second change, we see a massive change. People moving off the farms into into industry. But from 1970 to 1990, that ain't a very long period of time, is it? And we see another massive shift in the ability of people to increase productivity. Jobs begin to change. We now have IT positions that open up. Now you have to know something about computers if you're going to be able to be successful in the world of the future. This is where you start to see car manufacturers, auto manufacturers, start to replace workers with machines. And all of a sudden, the writing is on the wall. And we see, oh, automation is starting to take over. Some of these jobs, these, these repetitive skilled jobs that people had over the last 50, 60, 70 years, those jobs are going away. And you could see the writing on the wall. You could see it for decades, and yet people didn't, people didn't adhere to it. They didn't listen. They wanted to bury their head in the sand. They wanted to trust that the, U- the United Auto Workers was going to protect them. The unions was going to keep them safe. The president was going to keep their jobs here. But that's not what happened, is it? See, technology, just like it, ha- like it did in 1780, just like it did in 1870, just like it did in 1970, took over. And change happened, whether we were ready for it or not. Then we get to the year 2000. What happened around the year 2000? Well, it was actually kind of 90s. And you see how these kind of overlap, that we're building and overlapping on each other? Into the year 2000, we have the age of the Internet. And the internet changes everything. It changes the way we communicate. No more snail mail, right? When was the last time you got a letter from your long-lost aunt or uncle? No, no, no. You get an email. You get a Facebook post or message from them. Instantaneous communication. The ability to send information in nanoseconds across the globe and around the world. What a shift Massive number of jobs are obsolete and people are out of work. What, what happened during this period? Typewriters go out of business. Computers take over. Accounting jobs, the, the, the huge number of accountants all sitting in rooms crunching numbers by hand are gone. Computers can now do it in seconds. You see a massive shift as now everybody has to be online. It's not even an option anymore. It's gotten so big that guys like Bernie Sanders now say that it's a human right to have access to the Internet because it is virtually impossible to do business in 2020 without an Internet connection. And that took from 1990 to 2000, 10 years 10 years. Think about that for a minute. Think about what the world was like. 10 years ago, in 2000. And think about how much it's changed just since 2000 over the last 20 years. We are in the middle of another shift. And this one, in my opinion, is going to be the biggest one that we have ever seen. Because we are now at the point, where do we go from here? See, a lot of people ask that for a long time. 
They're like computer resolution. The monitor resolutions that we now have on our computer are so good that we can't increase them because your eye can't tell the difference. Your eye can't tell the difference between 5K and 8K. It doesn't, it, it's incapable of perceiving a change. We can send things within nanoseconds around the globe. How do we benefit from that? How do we increase? Where do we go from here in terms of technology? Jeff Bezos and Amazon can send you virtually anything within two days. No matter where you are, where do we go from here? We're limited by the laws of physics at this point. Where do we go from here? I'll tell you where. Automation and artificial intelligence. See, we are now at the point where automation is going to start to take over most of the jobs that you see that are repetitive in nature. I'm talking everything from accounting services to fast food restaurants to, uh, you, know, you name it. If it can be done and it's repetitive and it doesn't require creativity or outside-the-box thinking, it's going to be done by a robot. Now, these robots are not going to be in terms of art. We're not talking about uh, iRobot or anything like that. We're not talking about things that can think and act and are going to have feelings. Virtually anyone who will talk to who knows anything about artificial intelligence says there's no way that will happen in our lifetime. We don't understand enough about the human brain to understand how to replicate it in, uh, in artificial intelligence. But we can recreate virtually every um, logical process that needs to happen in order to perform a repetitive task. And that's where we're going to go. And then slowly but surely, artificial intelligence will begin to take over the rest of it. Artificial intelligence will begin to handle most of the phone calls, secretarial work, dictation, all of it. And we'll be able to do it cheaper and easier than we ever have. Now, what is this going to create for us? It's going to create two things. Number one is another massive economic expansion in terms of productivity. The, the quality of everyone's life is going to increase. Why? Because things are going to get cheaper and easier. Think about what it's going to mean when none of us have to drive our cars anymore. I mean, I don't know. I remember reading Remnants of a Stock Operator probably 30 years ago. And I read it the first time. No, it was 20 years ago. Read Remnants of a Stock Operator. And he was talking about uh, Jesse Livermore and being rich enough from making money in the stock market that he, could, he had a driver that took him to work every day. And I thought, how amazing would it be if I didn't have to drive to work every day. I remember thinking when I was working in downtown in Kansas City and I had to drive from the suburbs and it took me about 30 minutes in, 30 minutes out, about an hour, hour and 20 minutes round trip. And I thought, man, how much work could I get done if I had a driver who could take me to and from work and I didn't have to drive? In the next 10 years, every one of you is going to have the ability to have your own private driver if you want it. We're going to have that. We're going to have a luxury that's going to be an expectation. It's going to change everything. No more taxi drivers, no more Uber drivers, all these jobs that exist today, they're going away. Why? Because they're repetitive, because they're easy to automate, and because we have the technology, we're sitting on it. It's just a matter of time. Artificial, and this is where artificial intelligence is going to begin to take over. It's not the free-form thinking kind of artificial intelligence. It's the processing kind of artificial intelligence. It's the decision-making AI that's going to benefit our lives. So everybody is going to benefit from the productivity and the technological advancements. But here's the bigger problem. All of those jobs will go away. And there are going to be a host of people who don't recognize it until they get their pink slip. Until they say, sorry, folks. Your time here is done. The computers are just cheaper and faster than you. They work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We don't need you anymore. And the question is going to be, what skills will be left? What skills will be in demand? What will they need you for? 
in 20 years. They'll need you for creativity. And they'll need you for the next evolution. And what I love about this is that we are going to be living in a world where you are going to be paid for things that you love to do, for creativity, for your expansion, your artwork. You're going to be paid for your knowledge and skills. You're going to be paid for the benefit that you can bring to others in a way that we never have been before. You're going to have the ability to pursue things that you love, to pursue things that give you fulfillment. I said... You know, we're really living in a period in history right now that's unlike any other in the sense that for the first time in human history, you're allowed to consider what your what the fulfillment of your work, not just the work itself. See, we're so lucky. We've got so much that we actually get to decide, hey, what do I really want to do? See, in 1784, nobody asked that question. They worked on the farm Their father was a farmer. They were a farmer. They were a blacksmith because their father was a blacksmith. And that's where they stayed the whole of their lives because that's the one skill they knew. And that was the only way that they were ever going to feed their families. By 1870, people were starting to move off the farms and into the factories. But still, nobody was asking, what about my fulfillment? It's about how do I provide for my family? How do I make a little bit more so that at the end of the the season— I'm not starving to death. How, do I, how am I able to save just a little bit of money? And how can I have a little bit of security that a bad crop or a bad year isn't going to put our family into starvation? And then by 1969, as people are moving out of the factories, we're starting to see that shift begin. And people are starting to consider fulfillment in terms of what they do with their lives. But that was only available to a select few. Today, in this day and age, with the advent of the Internet, with the speed at which we can communicate with each other and the transactions that we can have with one another, every one of you has the ability to pursue your self-interest and consider your personal fulfillment in, in how you make your money. And if you're not doing that, it's not just that you're living a less than life. You're setting yourself up for failure in the future. Because the future is going to be, the future will be for those who learn this now and who start making the transition now. Who don't choose to stay in that repetitive menial labor job that's going to be taken over by artificial intelligence or through automation. It's dangerous to stay where you are. The world is constantly changing. Your life is constantly changing. From the day you are born until the day you die, you are in a constant state of change. And if you decide to sit, because here's what happens. Here's what happens to most people. Most people go so far in life, and then they park. And they say, this is where I am, and this is what I do, and this is what I'm about. And they stop. They stop growing. They stop learning. They stop, uh, they stop being. They stop living. And they start existing. And that existence is dangerous. If you are living in existence instead of a life, you are stealing from yourself, your family, and your future. You are putting yourself and your family at risk. It is not a question of if this will happen. It is a question of when. And as I've shown you over the course of today, that timeline is compressing. It's getting faster. Things aren't happening over 100-year cycles, over centuries. They're happening over decades. And we are about to hit a tipping point in the next evolution. How prepared are you? Let me tell you about our sponsor today, and then we'll come back and answer a couple of probably objections you have. Um, 
I want to talk about Elysium, which is a cellular health supplement uh, called Basis. It's made by a company called Elysium, and it's a, it's an NAD supplement. Now, what is NAD? It's found in every one of your cells and is involved in some critical cellular functions that generate cellular energy and activity um, known as the guardians of your genome. It's important stuff. But in your 20s, your body produces less NAD, and by, your mid, by midlife, NAD levels uh, may deplete by as much as 50%. Guys, I've been taking this every day for uh, the last mo- couple of months now. I got to tell you, I love this stuff. Uh, I've done a lot of research on NAD. I think it's one of the most valuable supplements that you can add to your, uh, to your repertoire. If you're taking a multivitamin or whatever, you ought to be adding this to it. And right now, uh, this is a great company, by the way. I like this company. Listeners can get $45 off a six-month or one-year subscription to Basis by visiting trybasis.com slash Jason and using the promo code Jason. That's trybasis.com slash Jason. And the promo code Jason, that's a full, uh, that's a full month of free Basis as part of your subscription and a great deal on a groundbreaking supplement, go to trybasis.com slash Jason. And again, yeah, this is just another example of new technology that's coming out that's adding to your health, your longevity, how you feel and how you look. And it's one of the other things that's going to be changing over our lifetime. Now, Matt, anything to add? I've been talking here for about 40 minutes here, and I know that you and I have talked extensively about this stuff and the importance of it, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll throw it at you. And if you don't, don't have anything, I'll, I'll go back to talking again, but I thought I'd give you a chance. I was, what I've been thinking about is the stuff that I've, I've heard from people that are, that are in, in tech and kind of in, um, I don't even know what you'd call it sort of tech adjacent where they've, they've talked about all the advancement that we've made over the last 40, 50 years in bits in, in technology but we've made basically no advancements in atoms. We our our understanding of, of physics and biology is hardly any different now than it was 40 or 50 years ago. Um, but the advancement in bits has now we've got to the to the quantum point, and that's where you're starting to see a a, a merge between the bits and the atoms. And so as as they're running into into barriers on the on the bit side of things they're starting to kind of return to studying the atoms and trying to understand what's what's at the very fundamental base levels of reality. And this is where you start getting into questions of what constitutes consciousness and and all of this type of thing. But um, ever since, it, it's fascinating to me that a lot of this change happened in like the 60s and 70s because of how, um, from the politics side of things, how much changed at that time where you have the, um, the end of the Bretton Woods arrangement, um, and then you have the the great society, so you're suddenly getting huge, huge amounts of quote unquote investment in and in welfare programs. Um, so that has created a it's it's skewed these studies. Um, we're not just getting organic um, people that are just people in programs that are just studying things because of their interests. There's a there's a massive uh, a financial interest that's that's inserting itself and redirecting areas of study mm-hmm. um when i think that's created this this um inefficiency and like, like eric weinstein i've said this before he says his the test he uses he says walk into a room and um strip away all of the screens from the room and then what can, do you have around you that tells you that you don't live in 1970 and there's very little um that's a that's a frontier that i'm fascinated by and I'm I'm really curious to see as as we under start understanding even better. Like you said something about the laws of physics a little while ago. And I mean, when you start getting into into um, particle physics and stuff, you start understanding that the laws of physics don't apply in some areas. So how much of a law is it? And how does how is that gonna affect our life as we realize as we study quantum systems and realize that we are quantum systems and what does it mean to be a quantum system and, and all of this stuff? It's it's all completely over my head. I don't understand it at all. But Jonathan in the in the um, chat here, he said, what you were talking about is all the supply side. What is all these new technologies that are being supplied to us? But what about the demand side? How does the demand side change? So this is and this is what got me thinking along these lines. What is the as as we um, are becoming more and more aware of who we are relative to our space in the universe and everything? How does 
how does our demand for new technologies change as we're getting more time for creative? Well, what, what, what are creative pursuits working toward? You know, humans need meaning, they need right. purpose. So what are we working toward? Yeah. And I, we've, we've talked on this show uh, some, on some deep levels about what, what is, what does it mean to have, what, what's the meaning of life and what's our purpose and, and those kinds of things. And, and I truthfully, I don't know what's going to happen when you all have, uh, when we have automated you know, automated robots and AI in our homes. Uh, we are, I just saw, I've been following this artificial intelligence stuff as it relates to the money side. So not in terms of the, oh, the technology side of it, but what are they creating? And I apologize to those of you, this being a family friendly show, but the bulk of that is going into uh, sex, the, the sex trade right now. How do we create um, some an, an automated robot that essentially an, an artificial intelligence that can act as a companion for you and can give you the love, sex, and attention that you're not getting or, you know, so, uh, along those lines. And what they're able to do now in terms of realism of those robots is pretty incredible. And it's, we're talking about early, early stages here. What's going to happen over the next 20 years when you could realistically have a, an automated machine, an, an artificial intelligence machine that can perform basic functions, cooking, cleaning, uh, fixing tires, but not just for men, for men but for women as well, uh, the perfect man, the perfect woman. What does that do to our society as a whole? Uh, these are all questions that no one has the answer to but that are going to radically change. I mean, imagine if you'd never had to cook another meal. Imagine if you didn't have to clean the house ever. You just bought this robot one time, gave it the upgrade patch the way you do your cell phone, and, uh, you know, change out the brain, uh, you know, the brain box, whatever, when you get a new one. And all of a sudden, every two or three years, you buy a new robot. And the new robot has all kinds of updated technology and things that it will do to you and for you. And what is the need now for a partner in this world. These are some of the things that, that I'm looking at now, but also the functionality of that. What's going to happen when those can now go to work for you and they can do all the stuff that you normally would be producing at your job? What does that leave, where does that leave you? Well, it leaves you in some sort of creative space, and I don't know what that creative space is, but I know within each of us there is that creativity. There is that search for knowledge and, and that search for, uh, for meaning. And each of us is going to find that in our own way. And what I love about where we're going and why I'm not afraid of it is that we have been on this track for a long time. And certainly I would say that we are in better shape than we were in the, 18, in the 1780s. That having, a, having meaning and purpose to our lives and enjoying what we do and, and being passionate about the work that we're engaged in, imagine if you didn't have to worry about the money side of that anymore. Imagine if, if our entire economy changed to the point where, you know, money wasn't the primary purpose, but meaning was the primary purpose. These are all possibilities in the future that I don't understand. What I'm more concerned about is the transition that's going to happen between where we arrive in 20 years or 30 years and now, because that's where the real pain is going to happen for a great number of people. And the nice thing is, is that when we look at the way the middle class is shrinking, we do see that the bulk of people, that there's a larger percentage getting wealthier than getting poorer. And even the poorer are less poor today than they were 20 or 30 years ago. But during this economic shift, it may happen very quickly. And a lot of people, good, hardworking, honest people, are going to be in a, are going to be in a really bad spot. Because they've never given any consideration to this. They, they're not watching how the economy is changing. And they're either going to be left impoverished or they're just going to be, they're going to just have a really, really hard time and struggle to make that transition. And, and I would like to avoid that by just making people aware of where we've come from and where we're going so that you can begin to start thinking through, okay, what do I want to do with my life? Because a lot of people don't even ask that question. They don't even say, well, what would really make me happy? Uh, aside from the money, because I've already said, and I, I can demonstrate, making the money is the easy part these days. It's not the hard part. It's the easy part. Figuring out 
what gets you, what you're so passionate about that you wake up every day excited to work? When I wake up at four o'clock in the morning and I'm excited to go in and start studying YouTube advertising, which is what I've been doing the last couple of days. I mean, what, what gives you that kind of passion and excitement in your life? That, that's a really hard thing because most people haven't given themselves permission to consider what their life would be like if they could do whatever they wanted. And I want to challenge you today. I want to challenge you to start thinking about that in your life. So start asking yourself, what would I do if I could do anything? What industry would I be in? Oh, I want to sit around and play video games all day. Well, guess what, son? 20 years ago, your old man would have told you that you need to, you need to think realistically and, do, and get a real job. Today, that is a real job. Today, sitting around and playing video games all day is a $100,000 a year business if you're good at it. Okay? They have entire networks. Twitch is an entire streaming platform dedicated to people who do nothing but sit around all day and play video games. There is opportunity everywhere. Don't ever let anybody tell you, well, you're never going to make any money at that. Because they don't know. What you need is a passion. What you need is something that you get up every day and you do like you need it like you need air. And most people are so beaten, beaten, so defeated that they don't ever allow, they don't even allow themselves to ask the question anymore. What could my life be like? What could I do? What would I do if I could do anything in the whole world? And the great thing about it is it doesn't have to be something that you do forever. Because you might do it for a little while and decide, hey, that's something I really like. And then say, you know what, I think I might like this other thing too. It's amazing once we give ourselves permission to be creative and we give ourselves permission to be hungry for knowledge and information to learn how much we want to learn. And the new things that we're presented with, the new ideas, the new roads that we go down and where we end up. If you'd have told me 20 years ago that I'd be sitting in front of a microphone in Los Angeles talking to you about this stuff, I'd have told you you were crazy. It's what, it's what giving yourself permission to dream a little bit does for you. And then giving yourself, having the confidence to just take a few baby steps in that direction. The nature of the internet is basically that we've kind of gone from being like isolated, atomized individuals to being almost, like almost literally a hive mind. And I think that that's beyond just the, the, the effect on our biology of, of being connected to this, these electronics and stuff. Beyond that, I think what we're, what we're seeing, all this kind of weird chaos and the weird stuff that's going on is the effect of the human race as an entity itself becoming aware of itself, becoming self-aware. Um, and the... And all this, these, the, the progression of all this time that you, you covered what you're seeing is humans are becoming more and more connected. That's what's happening. There's this connectedness. And now we're as connected as we've ever been. But interestingly, on a, on a, on a more subjective level, we're almost more disconnected than we've ever been. People are, are um, there's more depression and anxiety and suicide and all of these things as people have lost, lost meaning. So it's almost like um, we've become so connected that it's disconnected us and we've mm -hmm. lost what makes us individual, what makes us, us unique and what, what brings, I mean, when you're, when you're wake up every morning and you know, I've got to get all of these things done today, or I'm going to starve. That's very motivating. Yeah. But now, like you said, before we live in an age of abundance, you don't like obesity is more of a problem than starvation. There's so much that, that we don't know what to do with it all. And then at the same time, we're we're discovering like the, the the dissolution of the middle class is actually a very natural thing i think because as i've kind of studied human societies middle classes are are, are the the um departure from the norm it's very normal to have very sharply distinguished upper class and lower class a middle class doesn't last very long um just because of the nature of human power and the way that 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 um social elites wield power and the way they weaponize the lower class and so even now the majority of people from the middle class are getting wealthier and then the lesser, the smaller percentage is getting poorer. But even the ones who are poorer are getting wealthier, but they don't realize it. And 
Um, perception is the law. If I think if I'm getting wealthier, but I think I'm getting poorer, then it doesn't matter that objectively I'm getting right. wealthier. And this is what causes really unstable societies is when you have a a riled up um, working working class or plebs or the serfs or whatever. When they get really wound up, that's what up tips uh, like upends the apple cart and things get crazy. Um, so I'm I what I'm very interested in is as we as this this. Um, as people are, are realizing how much we can be creative and how much, um, how easy it is to earn a to earn a living, how easy it is to exist, um, as we start learning again what it means to live, I'm very I'm very curious to see the effects that has on the human race. If you think of the human race as 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 itself an entity, mm -hmm. that um, uh, as we learn what consciousness is and how what it means to be. Um, part of a quantum field where all people are kind of interconnected through this quantum field. Can we use that? Can we manipulate it in some way? Um, are we interacting in some sense with the planet? Are we, is there some sort of an electrical um, connection that we have to the atmosphere? And like, I, as we start to study and understand all of these things, and I, and I think that kind of study is starting to become more accepted. In the past, it, that would have been seen over the last several decades, that would have been seen as very woo-woo, weird spirituality stuff. But increasingly, we're recognizing that this is science, that this is where this is where like science and religion kind of blur, and they, they kind of become the same thing almost. And um, that effect then on the on the global consciousness, I think, is going to be really profound. Um, we're going to, over the next 20, 30 years, I think human beings are going to be, the, the idea of self-actualization is going to become a lot more of, a, of an accepted mainstream idea because suddenly we have, the, we have the time for it. And not only do we have the time for it, suddenly we're realizing we have demand for this because in the past, people kind of were just self-actualized by the very nature of the fact that, you know, if you're, if you're living in a cave and you're going to go walking out and there's going to be predators around you all the time, you're very self-actualized. You know exactly what you need to do. You know exactly, you're very um, tuned into your own existence. But now it's like we had to go through this wandering in the wilderness sort of to become, become disconnected from ourselves to suddenly realize, hey, we're all connected. And this means there's, there's meaning here. There's something to be found here, something to to be gleaned from this experience that, that will inform the future of, of our race. I hope, I hope you're right. I, I hope that we have, um, as, as the future on, I, this is the type of stuff, you know, when people hear you talk about that, a lot of them, you know, eyes may glaze over, but really what Matt's talking about is just an, an, an outlook on the future that's very positive that says, I don't know where we're going. And Reagan said, he's like, where are the jobs going to come from? He said, I don't know, but they'll come from somewhere. Like, it's just like we can see the writing on the wall. We know that there's going to be a massive change, that there is going to be an upheaval to our economy. And, and while a lot of people are wasting their time trying to prevent the inevitable, trying to secure their job and prevent robots from taking over and prevent companies from hiring them and trying to tax automated workers and all these other things that they'll try and do in order to keep jobs, uh, in, in, keep things the same, we know they're going to change. And we know there's nothing that we can do about it. We have to adjust. I always, when I used to talk with traders, I said, you can't control the market. This is the one thing you need to understand. The market will go up and down regardless of what you do. So stop trying to make it do one thing or the other. Your only job is to participate. And this life is going to happen and change is going to happen to you. Whether you like it or not, there's nothing you can do about it. Your job is to participate. It's a game if you want to play it. It's a game that's going to be played. And you just got to decide whether or not you want to play to win or whether you want to play to survive. And I don't like surviving. I like thriving. And the beautiful thing about where we're going is that in the future, you are going to be able to thrive doing things that you love. And what you've got to do now is give yourself permission to go and pursue that and figure out what it is. Now, I got to let you guys go, but um, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. We will be back here on Wednesday to do this all over again. And I hope this was valuable. If it was, please like and share it with somebody. Find a couple of people who need to hear it. A lot of you guys who listen to this message, you're already on board. You love hearing this kind of stuff. But there are other people around you in your life who want to hear this kind of thing. Send it to somebody. It's as simple as hitting the share button if you're watching it on YouTube or hitting that like button. 
um, or if you're on the podcast, just forwarding the podcast on to somebody else to say, hey, give the most recent episode a listen. I think you'd really like it. And you'll be amazed at the impact you have on somebody else's life. So until Wednesday, guys, be safe, be good. I'll talk to you then. If you enjoyed today's show, do me a favor, subscribe and then share it with a friend. And if you're ready to take the next step towards controlling your life, income, and future, then I'd like to help. Just go to controlthesource.com to get started.